Welcome back to Wardrobia. Tell you what, I'm having some fun with this podcast radio show. It's called The Pod 20, and it's on podcast radio, which, if you don't know, is broadcast on the air on DAB in London and Manchester and Glasgow and the home counties, and you can also get it online too. And the show I do, The Pod 20, is also a podcast. It's a cleverly disguised chart show. Because it is a chart, a podcast chart of the the top 20 podcasts. But I talk to the podcasters who make the the podcasts as well. And I spoke to uh, a great lady today, Anna Smith. She's a film critic. Right now she's covering for Mark Kermode. But she... Mark Kermode? Kermode. Did I make him sound like a toilet then? Sorry. Mark. Is someone I won't be getting on now. Anyway, um, yeah, so she's she's filling in for Mark Kerr mode. And, uh, but she's written for everybody. She's done articles for, for magazines, you know, Empire and Metro and Time Out. Uh, the Guardian newspaper, she's done uh, an article, which I mentioned. In fact, in fact, coming up in this interview, there's the moment where I credit her, I think rightly, with the decision to make Jodie Whittaker the new Doctor Who. Her podcast's called Girls on Film. This is my chat with Anna Smith. How are you doing, Graeme? You all right? I'm very good. How are things? Yeah, things are good, thanks. Nice to be chatting you today. Where are you right now? Looks pretty posh. I'm at home in my living room, which is now basically my home studio. So for the last months we have um, transformed the sofa area into a studio so I do a lot of broadcasting from here it's quite weird but good yeah it looks a, a lot more roomy than the wardrobe I'm in oh, really yeah well it's soundproof though very professional look I must say <laughs> all right well let's talk about we'll start I mean we'll get on to girls on film obviously because that's the podcast and we are podcast radio yeah but let's talk about doing the film review for Mark Kermode how did that happen so I've been filling in for him on and off for a few years now, actually. Um, but, you know, like most people, he doesn't take that many holidays. So I just sort of popped up now and again. Um, but it's become more of a big thing, I think, in lockdown, because as you will have seen, um, the whole show is filmed, um, in Mark's case, you know, from his home and then edited into an entire package. So it's just the one presenter talking to camera. Whereas when I used to cover for him, it was in the BBC News studio in London. So you just kind of rock up for 10 minutes, have a chat with a presenter, pick out a few films and it was live so it's very different now doing a pre-recorded package which is um it's more work but it's really fun because you get to write a script and pre-prepare and to really think it all through and um and connect directly to the audience you know because writing is your thing you're a journalist you've been writing about films for years in all kinds of magazines and in the guardian so how do you have to approach it then when you have to write something that you have to speak out loud well, it is quite different and obviously I'm guided by producers and such like, um, but yeah, as, as time's gone on, I've got more used to writing for the screen and writing for radio because obviously it needs to sound like the way that you talk, whereas you can write in a slightly different way, can't you? You can write for, for reading, is, is a very different process if someone's going to be actually looking at something and, you know, everything from the punctuation to, to the phrasing is different, really, if, if, you're, if people are reading it in their minds as opposed to you talking directly to them. Yeah, it's a uh, broadcast copy is usually short sentences and exactly words, not now rather than com- nothing is adjacent to it's next to that kind exactly. of thing. no yeah. complicated phrases, no really long sentences. Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. So the BBC, which is what this is on, they're famous for being impartial. Mm-hmm. And how does that work when you review a film? Because you might not like it. Well, obviously. <laughs> the impartiality doesn't really come into play when you're a film. It does, you get free reign then. There's there's no you pressure get, on you. No, absolutely not. No, I mean, I guess um, the film review is very much me or and primarily Mark um, and whoever else might fill in for him as a guest critic. So okay. whenever I went into the studio, it was very much a BBC News presenter. And then they'd say, here is our guest film expert. Um, so you will find obviously that there are plenty of people with opinions that go onto the BBC to offer their opinion on what they're an expert on, whether it's, you know, political subjects or, or films or whatever, any kind of entertainment. Um, so, yes, that is where we are We're allowed seen to as a guest rather than the voice of the BBC. Yeah, I guess so. But I mean, obviously, you still have a responsibility to represent the BBC. 
but um, I think everyone is sensible enough to know that a film critic has to have an opinion because that's the whole point of it. Yes, but the other thing with the BBC is because it's a, a public broadcaster, you're not allowed to endorse products. So you, you couldn't go on there and say, I really like this, I think you should buy it. However, if there's a film you really like and films are commercial entities, people make them to make money, or most of them, you can go on there and say, you should buy a ticket and go and see this film. You must see it. Well, I'm offering my opinion. And I think my responsibility is to the viewers um, and sometimes readers when I'm writing. And a big part of being a film critic is letting the audience know whether you think they would enjoy this film. Now, it's actually rare that I say, everyone must see this film because I think, you know, everyone obviously has different taste and there are maybe a handful of films which have broad appeal for everybody. But there's no way you, you tell someone from a completely dem different demographic to another that they should definitely see this film. So I think our job is to get the nuances of the film across to the viewers so that they can assess whether it's their kind of thing and also hopefully entertain them and enlighten them at the same time. So what is the film right now, the hot film right now, that you would, all right, you, you can't say that everybody would enjoy it, but, but a film you think should be taken notice of? The film I love at the moment, which I covered um, recently on the film review, is called Baby Teeth. Um, so it's an Australian drama. Do you know Ben Mendelsohn? Yeah. Terrific actor, yeah. So he's finally gone, he's, he's sort of went off to Hollywood and did loads of Hollywood movies. And now he's back on home soil doing a drama um, by Shannon Murphy, debut director. She's terrific. Um, and he's with Essie Davis and also Eliza Scanlon, who was in Little Women. Um, and they pay, Essie Davis and Ben Nelson pay the parents of a dying girl. But somehow this is actually a comedy, believe it or not. It's a dark, dark comedy and it has very, very moving moments. But it's about um, kind of dysfunctional parents who don't know how to handle their teenage daughter who falls for the local drug dealer. Um, very, very biting, sharp humour, character driven stuff, some moments of farce. And then sort of turns into a bit of a weepy. But yeah, I mean, it's not absolutely not for everyone, but hopefully by that description, you get a feeling if it is. It's called Baby Teeth. Baby teeth, yeah, that's my. And the one favorite. to avoid right now that's being overhyped. I mean, the one that's being advertised a lot is the um, the new Seth Rogen film. Is that any good? I wasn't wild about that, to be honest. Um, I thought American Pickle was. That's it, American Pickle. Fine, um, and American Pickle. I mean, I I do enjoy Seth Rogen sometimes, but I thought this one, uh, and he had a few laugh out loud moments, and the concept of it didn't really sustain the film for long enough. It was very much, I mean, he plays two roles as you will have seen. So a man who's kind of effectively frozen in time wakes up and then his great grandson. Um, and that's kind of funny, but to see those two talk head to head for most of the movie yeah. is just a little bit repetitive and there's not really enough variation in it. So I didn't love that, no. What worries me about the promo for it is there's that David Bowie joke. And I always suspect, is that the best joke in the film? Because if that's the best joke in the film, that's a long hour and a half for one joke. I've got to say that it probably is one of the best jokes in the film. Okay. But yeah, I think your instincts are correct there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, before we talk about the podcast, let's find out about you. Where did you grow up? Well, my dad was in the Navy, so we moved around a lot. So I lived partly in the United States, part, different parts of Scotland. But I did spend 10 years in Exeter between the ages of 8 and 18. So Devon really felt like home primarily. Um, so yeah, starting off, um, yeah, starting off America and then Devon really. And for you, was it, did you get into journalism or did you get into movies first? Because one, you need both. Which way did it go? What was the progression? Well, I mean, I, I did start writing for the lead student newspaper and the first, when I was um, at the university. And the first thing I submitted um, was a review of Basic Instinct, which was kind of, you know, to show my skills. At what age? Um, well, I was at 18, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I was at university. I wasn't like a child. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so I think I think back then, actually, even though I hadn't thought that film criticism could be a career, I had the desire to write about movies. And I did study Thelma and Louise and such like in uh, you know my English degree. But um, I went into journalism. I did a journalism postgraduate course after university. And then I actually started editing magazines. So I actually entered sort of being on staff as an editor. And it was only till I started writing about the films as part of my job as editor, sort of basically volunteering that I suddenly went oh my god this is what I want to do so it was quite late on that I discovered it well I mean I was in my mid-20s but by then I'd edited several magazines on the face of it it sounds like a really cool job it sounds yeah. like you get to watch films and then tell people what you thought about them but there must be a downside to does it in any way spoil the enjoyment of a movie knowing you've got to write something about it 
Uh, I'll always say I will never complain about my job. I mean, because it is the best job in the world as far as I'm concerned. I have worked really hard to get there and it's not like anyone could do it. But um, I, I love my job. The only thing I don't like really doing is my like, finances and boring, you know, the sort of things that any freelancer has to do because I'm freelance. The boring stuff, the admin. But yeah, that's you have to do it. Um, but it, I've always said if, if watching a terrible movie is the worst part of my job, then aren't I lucky, quite frankly. And do you watch them in a cinema or do they send you them and you watch them on a TV? Because I think it can be a very diff different experience. I mean, I know, I mean, I'm going back, this is years and this reference is really yeah. old, but it was in the, uh, the early 90s when they re-released Casablanca. And I'd seen it on TV loads of times, I think maybe three or four times by that stage in my life. And we were, I said, let's just go and see it on the big screen. And it was a totally different experience on a big screen. So how do you watch them? Well, um, the answer would be quite different the past few months. Now, of course, of normally, course yeah. Yeah, normally we would go and see them in press screenings um, in screening rooms around London or indeed sometimes if people are, you know, at other parts of the country. But unfortunately, most of the press, press screenings do take place in London. Um, or we would go and see them in one of the big multiplexes at what they call a multimedia screening with a load of other journalists and also sometimes even competition winners, you know, anyone who gets to see a preview of a film. Um, uh, it has been the last few years that you've been able to get art house films on links if you can't, for whatever reason, make the screening. But obviously big studio films, they've been very nervous about giving links out for security reasons and piracy reasons. But in lockdown, the, most films have had to find a way to show the journalists um, their work on a small screen so there's very very secure ways of watching them online but I've got a projector downstairs in my ha home and you know and I like I can see things on a relatively big screen um, really uh, what 16 mil or 35 uh, yeah well it's just you know just watching you plug in your laptop and watch it you know oh, I've husband. got you right sorry I thought you meant actual film I mean no that would be amazing no <laughs> but yeah it's just, just a way of projecting films that you know you can watch on your laptop or your ipad or whatever right um, so you simulate you, you, you simulate the movie experience okay. as close as you can <laughs> Some things you have the small. annoying person behind you with the sweet wrapper. Yes, so, so it's a win-win, really. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I've got a big TV and stuff. But, yeah, I mean, I, I do, because in lockdown, things have not been um, showing on the big screen, then we've just been reviewing things that are showing on the small screen anyway. So it's a fine way to review them. But when it comes now, now things are starting to come out um, on the big screen. I think it is important where possible that we get to see them that way, because that's how the audiences are going to consume them. But the like of the streaming services, you know, Netflix and that, are we are we possibly in a golden age of cinema? Well, what's great is there's so much money being put into film by the likes of Netflix and Amazon Prime and such like, and it's really great to see that. And my hope is that everything will continue to coexist and that cinemas who badly need the custom, especially now, will continue to stay open because the big screen experience is really exciting. But that lots of great films and perhaps in particular things like documentaries are going to get at their moment on the small screen and perhaps people are going to take more of a risk on the kind of stuff that they might not have paid to go and see at the cinema and I think that's what's good about the likes of Netflix is that people are discovering slightly more edgy or challenging fare that they wouldn't have taken that risk on you know spending 12 quid in the, in the cinema yeah. yeah you take a punt when you go to see a movie you really yeah, do yeah right? maybe they'll go and see that director's work on the big screen you know when that when that next comes along so that's my maybe might be a naive hope but I hope so and you're the chair of the, the film section of the UK Critics Circle. Tell me about that. What is the UK Critics Circle? Right, so it's over 100 years old and it's got several sections, including music and theatre. And I'm the chair of the film section. I used to be the president of the entire circle for a two-year term. Um, and it is a group of the top critics in the UK. And um, we meet to share our experiences. And many of us have award ceremonies so the film section has a, a sort of very well thought of uh, ceremony every year where most of the a-listers turn up but really it's about upholding the values of criticism and making sure that we all represent what we're reviewing fairly and that so we what all... are what are the values of criticism because a lot of people i'm sure would argue that critics have no values <laughs> well these are these are the things that we, we it's important for us to discuss as well it's like you know how do you stay relevant and what are the problems facing critics and one of the biggest problems currently facing critics is getting paid so um i you know it used to be that you could have a job for life on a paper 
and you would be the critic for that paper. And obviously in recent years, since the internet and such like, um, it has become a lot harder, um, not only to get paid for your work, but also for audiences to distinguish between bloggers or you know people who just kind of mouthing off online and critics who um, have made it their career and their passion and have seen a lot of films and approach it in a fair manner. And I think, well, I think some great critics have actually started off blogging, so I'm not sort of sagging off bloggers or anything like that. But I think there, there is, it, is, it can be hard to see the wood for the trees sometimes now um, because there are so many opinions flying out everywhere. So actually, uh, that's why I think criticism is increasingly relevant because people need to find experts who really are going to be 100% fair and well-informed. And I think right now, especially with the scene as there's so much choice with the Amazon Prime and Netflix and everything, we're just overwhelmed and you just you need to filter out the bad ones and look for the stuff that you might find interesting. So I've never been more important. Uh, yeah, you know, we've been spending, we, we watch hundreds of movies a year, you know, so the chances are if you go to a, a, a critic who does it for full time, then they'll have seen a lot of that stuff on Netflix or wherever and they'll be able to, you know, steer you in the right direction. So what is the best film ever made ever oh that's my least favorite question <laughs> i gotta ask it it's part of the rules isn't it you, 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 you gotta ask him what the best film ever is yeah um i think that's subjective and i think my answer would vary depending when you ask me um i think there are many 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 wonderful films um you i mean i i'm a big fan of mike lee's work so things like secret and lies you know there's slightly more understated character driven films what i personally favor more than anything but in terms of the big screen experience with wide appeal um, and something that struck a chord with me when I was young, which I think is probably, if you're going to say favourite film rather than best film, okay. then I'd say, I'd say Back to the Future. Yeah, yeah. It, and the it, first one better than the other two. They never quite got it right on the other two. I think number two was really good, actually. I, I found it, number two more of just a link film between one and three. Um, no, no. Even though the technology was of a higher spec because they could use that they, that technique where he played, in, you know, multiple characters and, and, and well, multiple actors played multiple characters. Yeah. There was just something about one, I don't know, just, I, I don't know. Okay, but okay. All right, Back to the Future. Yeah, I'll give, I'll give you that. I'll give you, I won't argue with you on that one at all. It's what sparked my love of cinema, I think, age 15, just watching it on Christmas Day, sitting on the bed, just going, oh, this is the magic of cinema, you know? Well, talking of time travel, mm -hmm. uh, in 2013, you wrote a great article in The Guardian and it was called Why Can't Women Time Travel? And you, you gave plenty of examples of movies and in particular, <laughs> poor old Rachel Adams, who had been in three movies that were about time travel, including The Time Traveler's Wife, and she didn't get to have the adventure. Um, that was back in 2013 and it was a great article and, and I know this is something that you, you care deeply about because of the podcast's title, which we'll get to in very, very, very soon. It's since 2013, we now have a female doctor in Doctor Who. Has Jodie Whittaker thanked you personally? Because clearly that article is why she got that gig. That's so true. Thanks for the credit for that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that you noticed that and that they were the BBC were listening to that. Um, yeah, I mean, our TV, interestingly, um, is always ahead of movies when it comes to representation because they can afford to take more risks. And you'll find that with the big studios, obviously, you've got um, whole panels of, of money, men, which generally are men, um, kind of making the decisions and going, you know, female lead for this, that, the other, not sure we can take that risk. And of course, it's much more complicated than that. But when I spoke to Russell T Davis, actually, for an article, he was he was saying that that, you know, TV is generally, you're allowed to take a few more risks and to be a bit more kind of forward thinking. And I think that's that's where the, the fact that, you know, the Doctor Who, the female Doctor Who has come before cinema having any anywhere near anything as exciting as that. Like we haven't had a female James Bond, for example. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, BJ Shea, he does the breakfast show at a radio station in Seattle, and he's a massive Doctor Who fan. And I asked him about Jodie Whittaker, and he said she's the best Doctor they've ever yeah. had. And he's a proper Whovian. So, yeah. I, yeah. I, I forgot to mention, though, it was because of you. And I'm oh, gonna right. Yeah, next I'm time. Gonna give you yeah. the credit. <laughs> now, you're a regular on the London junket circuit. Uh, whenever a new film com comes out, you you get to talk to actors and directors. Who's given you the hardest time? Because a lot of them get fed up with it. Because it's for anyone who doesn't know, you, you get, was it five minutes or 10 minutes with each? Uh, yeah. Each 
information goes in and what and and sometimes the people get a bit fed up <laughs> yeah that's true. and you know I, i've got to say i do understand that if you've been asked the same question 40 times a day by a whole line of in the people, third country this week <laughs> yeah yes exactly it must be exhausting and i think it takes all the acting skills that some of these people have but some of them are amazing and if I'm doing them for Metro, which I quite often am, I mean, you normally get about 20 minutes, so that's not too bad, and you have a chance to get to know people and to relax okay. with them. Yeah. Um, as you say, 10 minutes is really, really fast. I don't know if I should name names, but that I, I mean, I, I wish you would. There are some. I would. I would say that I have noticed a pattern, and, and I don't wish to sound prejudiced, but it does tend to be older male actors who are. They've obviously just been around the block one too many times, possibly making assumptions about a female interviewer, don't know. Um, but they they can be very testy. Not all, some are fantastic. But I've had the most problems with people like that who just are very, very um, monosyllabic. Um, just, they won't make any attempts for small talk. They're just kind of not even looking you in the eye, you know, and that and that's kind of rude. So yeah. there's, been, there's been a few of those, yeah. Well, but, but the, pa the pattern is the older men. It, does the pattern have a nationality? Is it mostly Americans? Um, I have to say a few Brits actually have, have been. Really? And, and an Austrian. There you go, there's a clue. Well, I know that is. I mean, they haven't <laughs> had that many, have they? Well, we're not going to say. Really? <laughs> mm, okay. Who was the most delightful? Oh, there's there's loads actually. Dev Patel is always lovely. I've interviewed him lots of times. Julianne Moore, um, Sigourney Weaver, um, Tom Cruise is actually really nice. Yeah, you know, so mm -hmm. even delightful. though he's crazy. <laughs> well, <laughs> I can't comment on that. Okay. I didn't spend long enough with him to judge that. <laughs> he comes across as crazy. But um, all right then, tell me about Girls on Film. So Girls on Film is an all-female podcast. We do occasionally have men on, but it's generally all women. And I founded it with Heather Archibald, our executive producer, in um, 2018. And the idea was to give a voice to female film critics and female filmmakers who are so often kind of ignored, or as you know, like on TV and on radio, so often it's male film critics. And I was finding that when I was going on TV, you know, you have a presenter and you have two guests and in the two film critics discussing something, and I was never paired with another woman. It was always with a bloke. But it was fine to have two blokes, but having two women, and especially as a female presenter, seemed to back them be, it would be sort of judged to be some kind of niche. So we wanted to show that you can have a very entertaining, fun film show with all women. Uh, so we launched that and I thought, okay, you know, we'll do this with female film critics. We talked about um, representation on screen. We have very lively reviews of upcoming releases. Um, you know, quite a light touch, but obviously looking at things from a fun feminist angle. And I thought, okay, let's try and get some actresses in here. And we weren't sure if any, any of them would come along or be interested. And by episode three, Kerry Mulligan asked to come on the show. And then since then, we've had like Linda Hamilton, we've had Maxine Peake several times. Um, we've got lots of great things coming up. There's so many big names have come on. So it's been really exciting actually to see the kind of response to that um, because it's clearly struck a chord with people. Um, women talking about film in a fun way. And the biggest compliment that we've had, which I've, I've been told by several men as well, is it makes them think about film differently. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's really lovely to hear. It's really important. Obviously, it's really important because the ratio, as you mentioned earlier, between the amount of male leads and female leads, it's like out of control, considering it should be 50-50 if it's to represent society, and it's nowhere near that. Um, but when they get it wrong, when they get the female thing wrong in the film, for me, it spoils it. Now, I watched that film, Richard Jewell, and I mm. thought it was a good film, the Clint Eastwood film. But it was totally spoilt for me by the way that the female reporter was portrayed as this two-dimensional woman that could only get the information from the man by flirting with him. And it totally destroyed the film. For, an otherwise great film destroyed it. And I couldn't recommend the film because of that. Do you think that is something that Hollywood has a problem with? Or is that just a Clint Eastwood thing with him being an old white geezer? <laughs> Yeah, Hollywood has a problem with it. Yeah, Does I mean, it? things are things. By are the getting... way, did you notice that too? I did absolutely. I remember discussing it. I think with another female film critic after I'd seen the film, and we were saying, well, it was based on a true story. So we were wondering, I, maybe you know, perhaps she did sleep with the guy to get the information. But we we really, you know, that was the only reason we think, because otherwise you'd be 
potentially slandering someone. But it did seem to choose to focus on that as well, even if that were part of the story. Um, I would agree with you. And yeah, Clint Eastwood often puts women to the, to the side of the story, definitely. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's been a problem in Hollywood as long as forever. Um, it's getting slightly better since the whole Time's Up Me Too situation and the conversation's getting louder with things like Girls on Film. But yeah, I mean, there's an inherent problem in that um, when scripts are written from the outset, so often they revolve around a man because we've all been growing up with male-centered stories predominating the narrative. And we've all been asked to um, relate to generally white men in the lead role. Nothing wrong with that, you know, we can all relate to that, but then how about a little bit of variety, you know, so as you say, reflect the world that we live in. And also to help young kids um, of both sexes, you know, to understand the experience of what the other one's going through, you know, and I think that's why things like actually Frozen are really good because you've got little boys getting into that film and, you know, understanding the, and identifying with girls and not seeing them as other, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think it's it, it's it's changing, but really slowly. And what Gina Davis, um, she, she's obviously a wonderful actress, but also has a this kind of um, campaign that she calls See Jane, which they say, if she can see it, she can be it. And she's campaigning for better representation, particularly in children's films and family films, because they're really important, because that's the first thing that people are going to see and grow up with. So she's campaigning to make people, when they're at, at the stage of writing a script, to think, Hi, hang on, what if I just switched the genders of the leads? And what if I just made that man a woman and see how that goes? So just to tackle the unconscious bias that a lot of people have. But it's not just the script stage, obviously, then you've got the funding and then you've got the people telling the stories and most of the funding going, being doled out by men and then going to men and people hire people that look like them and so it perpetuates. Yeah, and the men usually get paid more than the women too. Yes, indeed. I mean, what's great is people like Jennifer Lawrence speaking out about that recently and um, that conversation again getting louder. And I think it's getting harder for people to get away with it. And um, what we like to celebrate on Girls on Film is when you see, you know, the good things happening, we don't kind of, you know, I'm slightly kind of moaning now, but we don't really like to moan. We sort of celebrate the, the triumphs and, and, you know, like Wonder Woman, Patty Jenkins' film obviously was a huge success, massive movie. And that's helped pave the way to lots more upcoming superhero films directed by women. So again, these kind of family friendly mainstream movies, it's really important that they hire women to direct them and to write them and to star in them just as much as it is art house movies, because those have such a big audience. Also, as well, if someone takes their clothes off in a movie, it's usually a woman. Yeah, the I mean, we all know that inherently, but when you actually look at the statistics around that, it is incredibly shocking. And yet, even in, in, this, in the studies Gina Davis did with family films, um, that you would often see, you know, the women wearing needlessly skimpy outfits while performing their jobs, you know, and that had nothing to do with wearing a skimpy outfit. So, you know, there is actually really, really shocking. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think just everyone being more aware of it's really important. And what we try to do on Girls on Film is to kind of gently highlight that and make, make people watch like you very responsibly did with Richard Jewell, you know, just, just kind of question what you're watching and just go, hang on a minute, look, really? You know, is that right? Because we've been brought up with it for so long, you know, it it can, it can take a while to actually notice that, that what you've been watching is actually quite damaging and quite offensive. Yeah, and I think that's the same with a lot of things. If you look at 70s TV, you know, most people are ashamed of what was on the TV with shows like Love Thy Neighbour and the black and white minstrel show, you know, as far as race goes. And, you know, it's the same thing with sexism, sexism as well. And when you, when you know better, you need to do better. And yeah. Yeah. We, we talk a lot about sort of intersectionality as well. And obviously we have a lot of women of color on the podcast because um, it's even greater challenge obviously for them in the film industry. And I think it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's it, these two, these arguments go hand in hand. And we've also talked about people with disabilities, it's representation. Yeah, any prejudice part against of a, yeah. a part of society. It, it really, it's really, it's the same thing just for slightly different reasons. Yeah. Now there's a YouTube version of Girls on Film as well as the audio version. Is the YouTube version exactly the same as what the audio is? No, so we were invited by the British Film Institute to do YouTube episodes with them um, during lockdown because they want, they were doing some BFI at home and they wanted to reach more people at home, obviously, because people couldn't come into the cinema. Um, so it's been really exciting to do that in conjunction with the audio podcast. So we still we still have our ordinary audio podcast. Oh, it's a separate thing altogether. Okay. It's a separate thing, but then often what we do is, and we have such great guests, like we've got Gemma Austin coming up tonight as we speak, who's going to be brilliant. 
Um, and then we we often run the audio of that on the podcast and cross cross reference the two, but they are two separate things. So yeah, we've we've basically gone visual, which is which is brilliant and and really exciting, and it's been great to zoom across the globe to people. You know, we had Billy Piper on the first one; she was amazing. And then Sally Phillips and Ronnie Ancona were an absolute hoot. So you know, we have some great people on. Well, the reason why I put this on YouTube as well, I mean, I, we yeah. Zoom because of, of lockdown and, and whatever, and yeah, it's exactly. easier, and more people yeah. are available from home than if you ask them to come into the studio in London. Oh, yeah. So it's it's just easier. And I made the decision at the very beginning when we started doing this to put the Zooms on YouTube pretty much unedited because yeah. I realized so many more people have got time to watch video than they yeah. used to. Exactly. You know, they, a podcast are great, and, and fewer people commuting, which is where a lot of podcast yeah. listening goes on, and I wanted it to be a cross-platform. Have you noticed since lockdown, have you been, well, you, you mightn't have been doing it. I just want to know, have you noticed that the, the video version of it is getting more um, of an audience, and the during lockdown maybe the audio version it, it, it's 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 fewer yeah i think youtube's gone really well and what's interesting is also instagram igtv people have been really engaged with them on there so we've been trying different ways of reaching people um so yeah they all complement each other i think i uh, i spoke to Gemma moore do you know the um she's in um she's in host the film that's set on zoom have you seen that yet i have not is it good oh it's great it's it's um it's so there's like seven characters, actors, and it, it, the whole thing is on Zoom and it's during lockdown and they, they have a seance on Zoom and really? obviously things happen. And it is, it is really, really good. And Gemma, I spoke to a week before last and she, first of all, clear this up for me because I may have made a mistake. I referred to Gemma as an actress. Should it be actor these days? Mm -hmm. It became a bit of an Americanism to say actor, but I think they were probably slightly ahead of us because I can see the logic in just making it not gendered. Yeah. I mean, I'm happy to say it, but I generally, if I think someone, if I if I look at their own profile and they refer to themselves as an actor, yeah, just generally look on their social media. To see yeah, I was, I don't know. I didn't mean it as an, in, and she didn't That's take it. She took it really well, obviously. She was, yeah. she's lovely. But uh, I was, I was a little bit like, and I still don't know whether I got it right or not, but maybe I should just go actor. And that's probably the safest way to go. <laughs> no one's going to be offended by, by actor, are they? No, no, I don't think so. I think that's safer. Um, I mean, things things quite often change. Like we had um, unconscious bias training um, at the Critics Circle, and there, you know, our trainer said, "The thing is, people are constantly asking what's the most politically correct way to refer to something, and that is constantly changing. So, okay. you know, what might might have been good a year ago is inappropriate now, and it's fine to ask because, you know, what, how should we all know? You know, how should we all know? So, I always just try to consult people who are experts and, and Google Google it heavily to try to make sure I'm using the right terminology. But, you know, it's difficult. It's difficult to keep up, but it's important to try. Well, she is uh, an up and coming uh, British movie actor, but she's also a producer and she's produced things as well. And she's very keen on making sure, like the, the one, there's one, oh, I forget the name of it now, it's set in a toilet, but it's, a, it's an all female cast. And she's very keen on getting that kind of thing right you should get her on the podcast i'm sure she'd love to go on because she's promoting this movie host yeah she, and the she is room. is that the one the powder room that you're talking about the film that was I think it's called the powder room it's it's set in a, it's set in a lady's toilet it's it's got like right. a one word title oh geez okay. she did she did talk about it and uh anyway she's working on she's working on a lot of that stuff and um she did she did talk about the underrepresentation of of strong female characters yeah. in, in the movies but uh she was great the, the term strong female is one that's come up as controversial actually no. of, what, 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 how's that? that's that's a compliment isn't it you don't you don't want bruce willis to be a weak lead or you know, <laughs> wrong, you know. it is complicated but i think Again, it, it was something that was bandied around. People saying you need strong female characters. Yes, correct. But then the actresses or actors started to feel that there was some kind of pressure, like, oh, why should it be a strong woman? Why can't she be complex? And so we tend to use the word complex. It's been a discussion we've had with lots of people, including the director Carol Morley on Girls on Film and Emily Mortimer um, came on talking about it as well. She didn't like being called a strong woman. 
she came on with Dolly Wells and she was saying that, you know, she kind of felt it was kind of one of those labels that put loads of pressure on the actors and also the viewers, because as women, we just want to see ourselves represented as we are. It could be problematic. In fact, on Girls on Film, we often celebrate depictions of women who aren't idealised, women who are real, women that make mistakes. Like, you know, you look at so many crime thrillers with a very flawed male detective. Yeah. In the He's allowed Autoholic. to have a problem. <laughs> exactly. You know, he's, he treats people terribly. He's rude, you know, all these things. And he's still the hero. But you don't get to see that that much with the... Yeah, with the you don't hero. see it. Yeah, you've, that's a very good point. You don't see a female lead who has a substance abuse issue, who is a bad parent. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah but you'll get yeah. a male will have yeah. all those uh, qualities, using the word in its loosest sense, because it isn't quality. It's But anyway, yeah, that's a very, very good point. It's a very good point. We are starting to see it now, and that's why we were talking to the director, Carol Morley, about it, because she made Out of Blue with Patricia Clarkson as um, a detective with a drink problem. And she didn't have anything to do with children or you know parenthood but again that was really unusual so that's why we like when we see films like that we like to get the, the you know the, the people involved on to talk through why they made that decision and to talk about how we need more of it really yeah because in a movie it's almost like a man is allowed to be a bad father but someone who's a bad mother Ooh. i think yeah. there was a there was a bad mother in it's tv it's not movies in picard the Star Trek spin-off, there's one of the characters there was portrayed as a bad mother. And I think it's the first time I've seen that kind of thing with, without them being a bad person as well. She was seen yeah. as a very, as a positive person. She was, she was like the number two in command of the, the, the spaceship, but she yeah. was, she was a bad mother or she had a, a, a bad relationship with her child, with her grown up daughter. Yeah. 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 I mean women are not allowed to do that on the big screen very much and if they are they're generally judged or they're you know they're not the center of the story so it is extremely rare to see that and that's something that we're really keeping an eye on what podcasts do you listen to um i enjoy the guilty feminist i think that's a fun one which you've got quite a lot in common with um I had a phase of listening to the minimalists when I was trying to declutter it didn't work very well but it was great <laughs> to listen to it they, they are brilliant um and I, I listen to the Radio 4 ones like Front Row, um, you know, on BBC Sounds um, to keep abreast of all the arts shows and all the, the developments in the arts world. Um, and what else have I, the Gal Dem, that's really interesting, talking of intersexual femi intersectional feminism, um, that's um, a, a group of young women of colour and they've been doing a podcast recently, which is really, really interesting. Do you listen so, yeah. to, to any, like, inter I mean, so many are interview podcasts. Do you listen to any of them to get tips on how to interview the, the movie makers that you're going to come across? I do. I mean, I mean, hopefully I don't need tips in terms of interview style, but in terms no. of what... The, <laughs> oh, hopefully not. But in terms of, the, in terms of the, the people that I'm going to speak to, as as you do, I'm sure, and you seem to, do you, I really do my research. Sure. Um, and I will um, listen to them being interviewed anywhere that I can find because that is gold in terms of preparing, isn't it? And knowing what topics people might be strong at or how yeah. long they're likely to be or anything like that. It's, it's a nice way to research as well because you can do it lying down. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say do it washing up, but, you know, lying yeah. down. <laughs> okay. Well, I tend to, if I, if I, you know, I remember when I was going into the, uh, the one I did with Alan Alder, I listened to quite a few and I just listened to them lying down and, and made a few notes and right. stuff. But it was actually, it was quite nice. Quite a yeah. nice way to go. Other than sit and reading something off a screen. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. What are you looking forward to, Anna? Ooh, I'm looking forward to the cinemas being open in general um, and seeing more movies on the big screen. Um, there, In terms of actual releases, it's very hard to say because obviously only now are things starting to get scheduled obviously we've got tenets coming up the christopher nolan film and that's really big news um but what's that one about i haven't heard um, about that one yet so that's um a sci-fi action film um starring john david washington denzel's son um mm -hmm. so possibly time twisty um so that's that's coming out soon and there are some great films by female directors and there's a film called saint maud um in fact around sort of halloween time october there's going to be some really interesting female focused horror movies. There's one called Relic I'm looking forward to seeing. So um, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to, you know, the doors being open and for me to be able to get back into the cinema and host Q and A's as well. Um, yeah, really you, you do a lot of that, don't you? That's one yeah. of your specialities. That must yeah. be really nice actually, because you don't have to come up with any questions. 
you do. Oh, well, no, you do because you, you have to have a chat between yourself and the talent, as they call it, before throwing to the audience. I see. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know, it may happen that you have an audience with zero questions. I've had that. Or ah. one or two. It, it, you, know, it, you just don't know. You get shy people. Um, so, and you, you need to be ready to bring it back to, to, you know, your own questions. So you do. But no, I love doing it. I did. I hosted the first Q&A. We think it is the first Q&A ever to happen since, um, you know, cinemas reopened after lockdown for Summerland the other week with Jessica Swale. Lovely film with Gemma Austin. So that was, that was fun to be back, back in the saddle for that. The podcast is called Girls on Film. Indeed. We'll see where it is on the podcast chart this week. I'm sure it's going to do well. Um, I'm sure it will. I'm sure, I'm sure it will. I just know it will. It's a great podcast. Uh, thank you for being on, uh, on, uh, on the Zoom cast. Great and uh, continued success. And when can we see you on the TV again? You doing how long are you doing Mark Commode thing for? Um, the last one will be the twenty eighth of August. So yeah, that my my little run will finish then until Mark next goes on holiday. Right. So the first and the twenty eighth, you can see me. Or until something horrible happens to him, and we don't want <laughs> that. To say happen. that he's a lovely. Man. <laughs>